a dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something? Go get it. Period. Kevin, thank you for, for from the West Coast and joining in to uh, talk. I know we've been going back and forth, but got it pinned down now. So I'm excited to dive deep. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here with you, Anthony. Awesome. Awesome. Well, one thing I do want to start with, because I have been experiencing a lot of ups and downs and, and growth pains within business, is you actually have a big marketing background. Um, can you talk to that background and give a little light on it? And we can just focus on that sphere of things and, and dive deep there for a little bit. Sure, sure. Well, I, you know, um, I've been uh, uh, probably in the marketing business for, uh, gosh, uh, maybe mm, 35 years. And so uh, actually, uh, after college, I graduated, uh, I went to work uh, as a lobbyist in the state of New Mexico. And uh, really interesting and uh, but not something I wanted to do for, for a living. And uh, I actually, uh, because of that work, got connected with a political consultant that did work for Anheuser-Busch. And um, they actually decided to make New Mexico uh, the pilot program uh, for beer drinkers of America. Uh, and uh, I was hired at 23 years old to serve as executive director of Beer Drinkers of America. Now that's a pretty cool thing for a, you know, an old fraternity guy, and and uh, uh, it was it was really neat. It was really a, um, a grassroots advocacy organization, you know, that uh, protected the rights of uh, beer drinkers. You had to be 21 to join, and uh, got beer retailers involved and that kind of thing. And so that was um, uh, you know kind of a significant first job and a. Pretty cool right. thing. Uh, flew to St. Louis, Missouri, and I learned how to pour a beer. Um, uh, I was actually corrected <laughs> on pouring a beer uh, the wrong way, uh, right in the Anheuser Busch uh, dining room. Um, you know, in college, you tilt your glass and you mm -hmm. pour the beer in. Well, uh, that's not how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to just splash down the middle to bring out the full flavor of the beer, and so. I learned that there, but uh, that was a great experience. And, and from there, I, I made a bunch of you know, really great contacts. And then I became uh, uh, executive vice president of uh, marketing for the Birmingham Fire of the NFL World League of American Football. So I moved to Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, uh, we had to figure out how to you know, build a football franchise uh, it was really a really cool concept. Um, you know, it was half uh, uh, teams from Europe and half from the United States. And uh, to be part of that startup was, was pretty awesome. And uh, very proud of the fact that uh, uh, we had the largest crowd in history uh, in the uh, World League uh, for the U.S. We put over 55,000 people in legendary Legion Field. Uh, wow. The Birmingham Fire. And uh, I also brought in Jerry Lee Lewis to sing Great Balls of Fire at the 50-yard line. So uh, it was really cool and, and a great experience. Uh, from there, uh, I went, uh, the, the league bought back all the franchises and decided they were going to go strictly to Europe. And so from there, uh, the owners of the team at the time, uh, uh, the Malou family, uh, they... Uh, had the largest bank in New Mexico and said, hey, Kevin, we want you to come back and uh, be vice president of marketing of our bank. Well, I didn't know a damn thing about banking. Yeah. Certainly wasn't anything that really excited me over the long, long call. I used to uh, make jokes, uh, never stand near the elevators at five o'clock at the bank because you'll get trampled. Uh, <laughs> employees just wanted to get the heck out of there. Yeah. And that really wasn't the entrepreneurial world that I wanted to be in. And so it was really shortly after that, um, that uh, the Malou family uh, opened up uh, their first casino in Las Vegas. And they said, hey, Kevin, we want you to come and be uh, 
VP of marketing for our casinos. I said, well, I don't know anything about marketing of casinos other than going to you know Vegas every now and again at the time. And uh, they said, oh, no, you'll learn. You're, you know marketing, so you'll figure that out. Well, uh, I moved to Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, uh, after about six months, really was burning inside of me about starting my own company. Uh, mm. uh, my, my entrepreneurial juices were flowing. Uh, I wanted to uh, really do my own thing and spread my wings. Right. And so uh, from there, I started a company called Promotion dynamics and uh really a marketing company and i i probably did it all wrong according to uh, a college marketing professor but uh, <laughs> basically all i did was i called a bunch of people i knew i asked them you know to uh hire me to do business and um and within six months i was making a profit hired employees and um, the rest is history so that was that was 1994 and, uh, um, you know, since then, uh, a little later, I started coaching charities, uh, which is a foundation management company. And uh, basically, we're a one-stop shop for all things foundations. So we assist our clients uh, with their charitable goals. Um, you know, we, we help them with all aspects of it. And uh, it's really rewarding. And I always like to say that uh, we're really the luckiest people in the world because we get to make a living helping people. And uh, mm. it's really cool. It's impactful. And, uh, you know, you sleep good at night because you get to help people make a difference. Right, right. The best marketing is is authenticity. And, you know, you sound sound like your path towards doing most what you enjoy. So that's, that's the best form of it. And I've seen the videos you sent me too. Like people just enjoy, you know, being around you when you're doing your thing. And, uh, you seem to be, you enjoy talking about it too. So no logical progression. Like it's all everyone in business, just figuring it out as they go, you know? Absolutely. Well, you know, and, and uh, I'm asked all the time by like, you know, college kids and stuff, you know, uh, what's the secret sauce. And, and I tell them really there's three things. Uh, one uh, is hard work. Um, you really got to work harder than other people. Uh, most people are not inclined to work really hard. In fact, human nature is to take the path of least resistance. Uh, number two is have a great attitude. Bring enthusiasm, uh, bring energy to the office, or as I like to say, bring it to the locker room. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. bring something really positive. Nobody wants to be around a downer. Uh, people want to be around great attitudes. You have a bad attitude or, you know, your body language is bad. Uh, people take notice and it, it has a negative effect. On the, on the contrary, you come in enthusiastic, you got a smile on your face. People want to be around that and it excites you. And number three is loyalty, um, is, is being a, a, a loyal teammate. Uh, uh, not blind loyal, but being loyal uh, to the team, to the cause, and, and really working in a collaborative way uh, to get the job done. And if you, if you master those three things, hard work, uh, great attitude, and loyalty, uh, you have a great chance to be successful in life. And, you know, those are the things that you can't control. You obviously can't control the things you can't, but those are three things you can. And uh, I have found that if you subscribe to those and, and excel at those three things, uh, there's almost a guarantee uh, you will find purpose and happiness in your life. Yeah, the, the last one strikes a chord because the, and I'm a part of the Gen Z millennial range, but this thing of consistency and loyalty is, I wouldn't say hard to come by because that's just a broad generalization, but for people to stick it out shows a lot because now you have access to do so many different things, so many different opportunities. And digital age allows for such things but to stick it out and stick with something not only do you become a master if you're focused on that one thing but you learn a lot through those trials like yeah people can quit for different reasons and they're meant to leave certain things but to stick it out and and never give up and be loyal to a cause and a mission i learned it from sports first on you know 
private Catholic high school playing football. I wanted to leave my third year, but I stuck it out. My dad told me to stay. You got to be a man of your word. And I stayed for the fourth year. We ended up winning a state championship in football. And there you go, man, the reward way, way greater than if I were to leave. Well, a a absolutely. You know, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's concerning to see, you know, some of the media out there now almost celebrating people quitting their jobs, like national I quit day or quit your job week, or, you know, that's the new, new hot thing now. And I, I think it's such a disservice uh, to younger people, because I promise you as an employer, if I, uh, when I hire and I look at that resume and I see four or five different jobs in a short period of time, the first question I'm going to ask myself is, is this person going to stick with my company? And do I want to invest in them uh, uh, resources to make that commitment? And I, and I, and I really think, um, you know, nobody should be in a situation that they're, you know, miserable in, but there is no utopia. Uh, there's no perfect job. There's no perfect wife. There's no perfect life. There's no perfect kid. We're all imperfect. All of us as people, we're all imperfect people. And, right. and, and, and I always tell people, I always strive for that perfect event or that perfect fundraiser for a client or the perfect campaign for a client. And in all my years, I have never gotten it. And while that's always been my goal to hit perfection, the fact that we as humans are imperfect can never really achieve, can achieve perfection. And so that's, um, you know, something that I think is in, in, important to point out. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to aim high, but you know, you land among, if you have high standards, you land a little bit lower than that but it would be far greater if you were to aim for a mediocre point and go even lower. So totally, totally resonate with that. I was going to ask too, and, and you're talking about that, what's an event you most enjoyed putting together? Um, Cause I'm sure they're all valuable and important and, and you do get a lot of great blessings from them, but what's been one that's really stuck out? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a hard question because uh, as you say, you know, we, we get to do a lot of really great, meaningful things. I think I probably say, you know, two or three causes that are sort of near and dear to my heart and, and all very different. Um, one we just did recently uh, that was on NFL Network uh, was the HBCU Legacy Bowl. And the HBCU Legacy Bowl was presented by the Black College Football Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, the HBC Legacy Bowl uh, provides an opportunity for HBCU NFL draft eligible players uh, to get exposure. And we've part partnered with uh, the National Football League. I mean, a whole bunch of national sponsors, Adidas, Coca-Cola, Coors, State Farm, Riddell, uh, uh, NFL superstars who have gotten involved uh, from Patrick Mahomes to Aaron Donald to uh, Jameis Winston to Teron Armstead to Bobby Wagner. And wow. everybody's come together uh, to, to provide um, these really great athletes exposure because uh, really, you know, uh, HBCU, uh, HBCU football now is getting some exposure. Uh, Deion Sanders, I think, has uh, brought a lot of limelight to it at Jack State. Um, but prior to what happened in uh, the summer of 2020, where sort of America erupted uh, with, with a, a racial reckoning and um, HBCUs were uh, not given opportunities. They weren't on TV. So a, a scout is gonna probably not make a trip to Grambling, Louisiana to maybe see a question mark player. A lot of scouts will watch TV. They'll see the game of the week. HBCUs didn't have that. In fact, last year, there were zero HBCU players drafted. Uh, we're optimistic that uh, come at the end of the month, next mm -hmm. week, uh, that uh, we will see uh, a significant number of HBCU players get drafted, which would be you know, a huge uh, 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 improvement. But, but putting that together this past February in New Orleans uh, was, was tremendous. Uh, right. It was uh, great to just 
you know, worked closely with, with uh, so many legends and Doug Williams, the first Super Bowl MVP of uh, African American, the first to start the Super Bowl, the first to, uh, uh, to win a Super Bowl. And so uh, that's been great. And, and James Shaq Harris, the first full time starting quarterback, African American in the National Football League, first to lead his team to the playoffs, first to be named to a Pro Bowl. And these are two giants. Uh, um, I like to say Jackie Robinsons of, of, of football. There was a uh, sort of this uh, uh, belief, uh, uh, really uh, talk about bias uh, and a and, uh, perception that uh, they put out that a black person mm -hmm. was not smart enough to be quarterback. And so Doug Williams and James Harris uh, crushed uh, that bogus uh, claim. And, and so they're really significant. And now uh, you see maybe 40%, 35, 40% of the league's quarterbacks who are African-American, but those guys were trailblazers. So to work with them, uh, to, to bring this thing to life was, was really awesome. Uh, in addition to the game, we also did a career fair and so allowed uh, uh, juniors and seniors from HBCUs, non-football players, uh, to participate in a, a career fair. And we had 50 of the top companies there helping with jobs for, for non-athletes as well. So that whole thing was really great. Uh, you know, a couple of others that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, I also worked uh, with the leaders of the Polynesian community. And we started the Polynesian Football Hall of Fame. And uh, that was awesome. It is awesome. And uh, that honors the, the greatest Polynesians, uh, coaches, players, and contributors. And about six years ago, we started the Polynesian Bowl, uh, which is played in Honolulu, Hawaii, and it's on CBS Sports Network. And uh, it's become one of the top high school all-star games in the country. Uh, this past year, we had the number one player, two, five, eight, 11th top player, ranked player in the nation. And uh, it's just really an awesome thing. 50% of the kids are Polynesian that play in the game. The other half aren't, and that's by design. The board of directors, led by uh, Jesse Sapolu, uh, four-time Super Bowl champion of the 49ers. Uh, other board members include Ma'a Tanavasa, Vice Ekehema, a Philly guy, uh, mm -hmm. who's actually a, a news anchor there, my dear friend, and uh -huh. uh, Troy Palamalu, uh, to name a few. Uh, uh, make up the board of directors and we started the Polynesian Bowl and uh, uh, that's really an awesome thing but the idea was to, to share the Polynesian culture uh, with kids who uh, don't know anything about it so you get a, an inner city kid from Chicago uh, or Philly uh, a rural kid from uh, uh, you know uh, Iowa and you put them together with Polynesians and they learn how to do the haka and all kinds of cultural things that are really cool. So, so that, that's what a reward again. As I, as I, I mentioned, uh, another client that, you know, is near and dear to my heart and things we do for them uh, are uh, uh, the U.S. Navy SEALs. Uh, we work closely uh, with the SEAL Legacy Foundation, uh, helped the founders get that started, been going strong for over 11 years now. And and have made a difference in the lives of others. In fact, we just uh, today finished up our golf tournament in Houston, and uh, it supports you know kids uh, of uh, fallen seals, current seals, uh, to further education, uh, support for you know uh, some of the challenges in the community like PT, you know, SD, uh, 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 you know, support for families, you know, uh, whether it be mortgage assistance or things of that nature, mm -hmm. you know, to really help that as well. So those are three, you know, really different kind of uh, foundation clients we work with, but all very uh, meaningful. And, you know, again, uh, just to have a chance to make a difference and, and help them is, is pretty mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. It shows the scope of what you work on with your company. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And 
is there a lot that goes into designing and making these events um, or even supporting these charities to, to bring them even more to life? Because I think, you know, there was an event held recently. I'm in Austin, Texas for uh, our restaurant and, and some other surrounding ones. And that alone, just a small, small space, difficult to make happen uh, well. So what goes into making and supporting uh, charity events for you? That, that's a great question. So what I would tell you is um, every time we start a foundation, uh, it's really starting a new company. While it's mm -hmm. nonprofit, we have to create the brand, um, the marketing strategy. Um, we got to bring it to life. Like and, a startup. Yeah. And, and we do it every day with our, with our company, Coaching Charities. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, you have to be thoughtful and, uh, you know, really thorough. And, you know, because we have tried and true technique that has worked, you know, regardless of the cause, I always like to say, you know, we've done hundreds of charitable causes, you know, raising millions of dollars uh, all across the board. Uh, that includes some of the biggest philanthropists and celebrities in the country uh, to help make this happen. And so you have to kind of know your audience um, about raising money, uh, about making it uh, successful. Uh, over 80% of nonprofits in this country raise less than $100,000 a year. It's very hard. Uh, it's just like a regular business. And so you have to have narrative, a storyline, uh, something that really, uh, you know, will pull the heartstrings and get people to reach in their pocket to make a charitable donation uh, to support your cause. And so uh, there's a process. I always like to say there's a two-step process in this. The first piece uh, is friend raising. And then mm. you start fundraising. And uh, you need to have friends before you can start out with funds. <laughs> I like that. And so uh, that's sort of the, one of the principles that, that we apply to uh, our approach. Right, that's, that's amazing. It sounds so similar to the way startups have their, their friends and family round and then they have their angel round and then go on to more institutional stuff. But um, yeah, so entrepreneurial, which as you talked about with your journey became more detached from corporate and more entrepreneurial much more than I thought, you know, goes into it, which is great. Yeah. So what are, are you currently focused on just those three right now? Are there any new? No, no, new well, we have, you know, we have uh, 33 different foundation clients. Wow. That we work with, we work with a lot of uh, NFL stars, uh, we uh, currently work with uh, three Super Bowl MVPs. I mentioned one of them, uh, Doug Williams, uh, Patrick Mahomes Foundation, uh, 15 and the Mahomes, uh, Nick Foles, Super Bowl MVP for, uh, is it your Philadelphia Eagles? Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Philly, yeah. Philly, 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 Philly. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, we, we uh, work with uh, uh, Tua Tonga Bailoa, his foundation, uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, his foundation, right. uh, Justin Simmons of the uh, Denver Broncos, uh, Darius Leonard, uh, all pro uh, for the uh, Indianapolis Colts, uh, Panay Sewell, the actual the Sewell family. They got a couple of more brothers coming along the way who are going to be great NFL players. The Sewell Strong Foundation. Uh, that's the name of a few of, of yeah. some of the football uh, guys we have. And, and uh, so – Mostly uh, sports, but not exclusively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. What is it like working so close with guys like that? Like, are you the one directly in contact with them, or is, is other people on your team more so? Well, uh, I'm very fortunate to have a great team. Um, I have uh, uh, a great management team, um, and uh, everybody we sort of uh, – I, I assign everyone sort of the point person – for a different foundation. And so they basically manage uh, that foundation. We're all involved with everything. We help, we coach, 
uh, hence the name Coaching Charities. Uh, we're a consultant. That's what we do. And we, we consult on uh, best practices and, and make it happen. But, but yes, uh, all of us are, are, are involved and uh, provide uh, best uh, 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 you know, ways to, to, to be successful. Mm-hmm. And so I will tell you, you know, we are very fortunate that, uh, and actually, and I don't want this to come across wrong, but really selective on who we partner with as well. Of course. Uh, the people that I've named are unbelievable people. I mean, and for us, that's sort of a prerequisite. If you're going to, I would tell, I would tell uh, everybody that I've talked to in all my years of, of uh, pitching uh, my company um, that especially a, an athlete, a, a pro athlete, and I would tell them this, if your heart uh, is not in this 100%, don't do it. Don't do it as a brand enhancer, do this because you genuinely want to make a difference uh, to use your platform to help others. And then if you just want us to do it for you, don't do it. Mm. You have to be involved. Now we know there's times of the year during your seasons that you cannot put the time in, but uh, you need to be involved when you can. And, you know, uh, it's very important because, uh, you know, they are on their board of directors and they run the foundation. We do not run these foundations. We provide counsel. But at the end of the day, independent boards uh, and uh, with their involvement, make the decisions. And uh, we just try to give them the best advice possible. But they have to be involved. But I, 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 I will tell you, and, you know, I'm not just saying this. We love our clients. They've been with us a long time. Uh, they're, they're, they're friends. Uh, we care about them. Um, we're fans of theirs. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, we just, uh, we love what we do, uh, helping them. And uh, so, again, you know, just feel very fortunate to, to be in this position to help make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to ask the most rewarding thing, but it, it seems to be just that. It, it makes me think of people that went to my high school who were absolutely historic and legendary, the uh, McCourty twins uh, in the NFL, two amazing defensive backs, and they were just stellar athletes, you know, basketball and football, um, and then went on to Rutgers and Jersey, surreal Jersey guys, but they have foundations for I think sickle cell disease because their mom had sickle cell disease and narrative 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 yes exactly exactly and you know I see the brand partnerships they do just to raise more funds and stuff but they I think Jason and probably Devin one year ago they won the Walter Payton man of the year award from the NFL so to just see stuff come out of that it makes you it it's humbling but also like there's so much love in that. And like, you just feel good seeing such things, especially me seeing those guys come from St. Joe's and do such things, but just in general, people doing things bigger than themselves and rallying people around that special. So I can see how you feel every day. (laughs) Hey man. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. Yeah. is, Is there anything you would like to, you know, touch on maybe things have been ruminating in your head, just stuff with the foundation, foundation you've been working with or with your company or just in general? Um, What I've learned in my life, you know, we're all in pursuit of happiness, right? With that's, we all want to be happy. Well, purpose gives you happiness. When you have purpose in your life, you're the happiest. And we all have to find our purpose, whether uh, it'll be a, 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 a career, uh, your family, but whatever gets you up in the morning to get you out of bed uh, and finding that purpose. And if you can find purpose, you will have a lot of happiness in your life. Everybody tries to seek that purpose. And if you find it, you grab onto it and you don't let go. Mm-hmm. And you, 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 you know, you, 
go for it, man. And it yeah. makes a difference. I always say, uh, you know, in life, I said this earlier, there's no utopia. It's no perfect life. You know, the, the, the secret of life is uh, having a great life. Uh, you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days. And the key is to have more good days than bad days. Mm. And, and so you have to keep it in perspective. If you're looking for that, like I said, utopia, you're going to be really disappointed in your life. Yeah. Because there is no, as I said, perfection. Yeah. It makes me think of sports too. You know, you're such an involvement with that. Um, showing up every day and you know, making the most out of it and yeah, putting a larger perspective that it's like an upward, it's like an upward loop from, if you have like a graph from the bottom left to the top, right, it's like going in loops, but upward into the, into the top, right. So it doesn't look good maybe early, early on or up close, but over time, just keep going 100%. forth. 100%. Yeah. hundred percent. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's really about it, man.